Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, we're here doing the Wisdom of the Pathwork series where we just explore these lectures. And tonight we're exploring Pathwork Guide Lecture number 38. And this was originally uh, transmitted October 24th, 1958. So one of the earlier lectures. So, and it's titled Images. And I sort of summarized a little bit of what he's saying in the very beginning here. He's basically saying that this path is a path of self-knowledge and looking at ourselves truthfully. So as a first step in self-transformation, you know, that's, we need to see what's really here. And then, you know, the deeper question that we end up with often is how does change happen and in, in this lecture he's taking us a little further you know to go beyond our tendency to just kind of try to apply willpower to the situation right and he's saying that first we have to discover and dissolve the image so again self-knowledge is is a step here so welcome jasmine he says um Greetings in the name of the Lord. Blessed is this hour. Blessings for all of you, my dear friends. Most of you have made serious efforts on your path of development and the spirit world has decided that you are ready for stronger medicine. So we'll take this work a step further. There comes a point when your struggle on the path becomes a bit discouraging. You have begun to recognize your faults. You are full of good intentions to overcome them. You may even have succeeded in small measure. You recognize some of your wrong attitudes and you wish to change them with all the willpower at your disposal. Yet you must face the fact that the outer willpower is insufficient to do so. No matter how, hold on, I'm just gonna like, Let's see if we can. Is everybody muted? I'm hearing some background sounds. So just check and see if you're not muted. I thought I could do it, but I couldn't figure out where. So um, continuing. Um, so he says, no matter how hard you try, you seem unable to make change and you ask yourself why. Ignorant of the causes behind this inability you are often inclined to either give up altogether and tell yourself that it is useless. And then I think another thing that often we do is just try harder, right? You know, or try to, you know, kick ourselves or beat ourselves more for not trying to be able to do it. And he says, that's where our gravest mistake lies. My friends, it is important to realize that over the course of a lifetime, usually even in earliest childhood or infancy. Every personality forms certain impressions due to environmental influences or to sudden unexpected experiences. These impressions or attitudes usually take the form of conclusions in the mind of the person. Most of the time, these conclusions are wrong. You see and experience something unfortunate, one of the unavoidable hardships of life, and you then make generalizations from them. These generalizations later establish themselves as preconceived ideas. And you know, we have to remember that when these form, we're often very young, and so our, our understanding of the world is limited. And so that also is often reason why the conclusions are erroneous. So anybody want to comment here? Anything just to pause for a second? Any questions or? So the conclusions are not thought out. Rather, they are emotional reactions. And, and I like this general attitudes towards life. We don't realize sort of how they become these subtle, you know, general attitudes that we carry inside of ourselves. <clears throat> and they're not completely devoid of a certain logic, but it's, it's not the ultimate and total reality, right? So as the years go by, these conclusions and attitudes, they, they sink into the unconscious. 
and in large measure that's you know uh, you know below the where the level of our awareness but it's often embedded in the body right to me you know I, whenever i hear unconscious i think think of body right you know it's like this is where we store these things and they kind of get held inside with our uh, our body defenses as well and then from there they mold the life right so they actually are molding the life of every person to some extent so we call such conclusion an image since we spirits see the whole thought process as a spiritual form or image. You might contend that people who can also have positive, healthy images engraved on their soul. So he's, you know, they're saying, you know, do we have these healthy images? And he says, that's not true usually because when it's a not, when it's a healthy image and not a, a erroneous concept, right? The thoughts and feelings are, are fluctuating, dynamic, relaxed, flexible, right? The truth is never rigid, which is the, the signature of the image. The whole universe is suffused with a number of divine forces. Thoughts, feelings, and attitudes that are unconnected with an image flow harmoniously with the divine currents, adapting themselves spontaneously to your immediate needs. So, you know, like in the, uh, you know, level of existence where we're really present and connected to the higher self, there's a kind of divine flow that we can tap into. And, and, and it's a part of what he's saying that we're aiming for, right? As we try to clear these blocks that are created by these images in this energy system that we have so that we can relax and trust and, and listen more subtly to these uh, guidance factors from the higher self, from the Holy Spirit, right? So we have to um, see and remove what's blocking and then open to these deeper forms of guidance. She so says, the forms of thought feelings emanating from wrong images are static and congested. They do not give in accordance with changing circumstances. Thus, they create disorder. The pure currents flowing through a human soul become disturbed and distorted. A short circuit is established. So I don't know, um, you know how people are with these kind of energetic descriptions of of things that the guide is using here, but I find them useful. And so does anybody wanna say like, can you kind of follow what he's talking about in this understanding so far? Can you figure out the unmute, Graham? There. Yeah, it, it seems that, um... You know, when, when we're, when we have no language and no filters to protect us as children, there are powerful messages go, uh, that go straight into our unconscious because at the time we are mostly unconscious. And without the filters and defenses, without ways to see thing, what things really mean, um, you know, what causes things um, and so on, uh, distortion happens. And um, I don't know, the, the question came up for me whether, um, you know, where the divine flow is. Usually you think of, <clears throat> you know, an innocent child, uh, pre-verbal little baby as being in a complete flow, you know, and yet they're totally unprotected, um, which makes them vulnerable to these uh, you know, accumulating these images that don't don't go away that easily, you know? And and it's interesting what you're saying here, because I think the guide, you know, is talking about later on in this lecture, a little different understanding of where these images come from. 
But you're right in part, you know, there are the messages that are imprinted from outside of us, sometimes from our, you know, culture and clan pattern and, and family of origin sorts of things. But he, he also says later on, we come in with pre, uh, uh, you know, kind of pre-imprinted imprints of beliefs and ideas that are already embedded in the soul itself, even prior. And we actually sort of choose those circumstances to activate those. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but I think it's a really interesting way that he you know, talks about that so that we really aren't victims of that, but it is definitely a part of the journey, right? That we have to, as we grow up, as we awaken, as we gain more consciousness, more awareness that, you know, we begin to examine the, you know, first of all, like where there's defenses, there's an image, right? There, there's a false belief. And the guide says there's never any reason for a defense that we can actually become undefended again. And, and it's the defense is justified by the false belief. So if we can kind of look at the belief, bring it into consciousness and recognize, you know, maybe it has a piece of truth, but where it's not, you know, and in, in it's got distortion as well, then usually we can find a way to you know, like, like ground in our own authority and be with whatever it is in a way that doesn't harm ourselves. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, part of coming into our adult capacity, right? You know, of, of separating out and, and forming our own inner authority, which is a part of this. And a part of that is like, well, then everything that the child got imprinted with, we have to bring back up into awareness and determine, do we, is that really the truth? You know, is that what we believe as adults now? And then where we see that we don't, then we also need to go back in and re-educate the inner child. The inner child, even if we as adults recognize the image, unless we work with the child and help the child get it, right? And, and relax out of the, you know, the, the trauma, because what he's describing here is basically the response to trauma that we have, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so part of it is in that we get frozen, right? So that's what blocks the flow, the natural flow. And what we have to do is thaw so that we can let the flow happen again. And in order to do that, we have to have courage and challenge you know, and, and, you know, see, see what the belief is and then sort of jump off, you know, the cliff, because if we believe something and then we, you know, we're, you know, like questioning that, you know, the only way we can know the final truth is to risk something, you know, risk letting go of the defense, risk letting, you know, letting go of this belief for a moment. And, and it feels to uh, inside of us like we are very vulnerable, right? And, and uh, maybe we are even jumping, you know, off to our deaths. But usually what happens when we allow ourselves to do that is that, that we, we soar, you know, it's like a new freedom has found a, uh, instead of dying, we, you know, go into the shamanic, you know, upper world kind of experience and, and soar, you know, it, it transforms us nice. as nice. we're no longer afraid, right? Nice. So <clears throat> adding a few pieces from a few other lectures there, uh, let's see where, where else, you know, we'll probably weave this all together in that, but excellent, thank you. Anybody else yeah, wanna chime in here? So continuing on. So in, in the way that we in spirit world see images, uh, you know, they, they see these forms, right? And the way we see and feel them <laughs> is kind of through our experience. Now, I think we can actually learn to feel them more energetically than, than this, but he's say, saying here, like through the, the kind of emotional and 
uh, feelings of unhappiness, anxiety, you know, like where we have uh, things that we want to change and we can't seem to change it, where we have kind of a recurring pattern in our life that we keep, you know, like, like sort of Groundhog Day, you know, waking up, here I am again, you know, maybe it's even in a different circumstance and with different people, but it's kind of like the same pattern. And we recognize that inside. So saying like, if those are happening, that's usually evidence that there's this image embedded somewhere within us. So the wrong conclusions that form an image are drawn from ignorance and half knowledge, and thus they cannot remain in the conscious mind. As the personality grows up, your intellectual knowledge contradicts your emotional knowledge, and you therefore push down the emotional knowledge until it disappears from consciousness. So this is partly oftentimes, you know, you hear that inner voice when you're having an emotional reaction, trying to argue you out of it, you know, or saying, you know, stop being a wimp or, you know, it's, it's always denying what you're actually feeling and trying to make you feel something else or be some other way. So the, the more emotional knowledge is hidden, the more, the potent, more potent the image becomes. How can you be sure that such images exist in you? In the first place, your inability to overcome certain faults, no matter how much you want to, indicates that an image exists. I have sometimes mentioned that people love some of their faults. You know, we love them, we, we can be attached to them in other ways too, but you know, like how and why would they love them for the simple reason that according to the image, certain faults seem necessary as a defense, as a protective measure. And this, of course, is unconscious reasoning. The conscious effort to overcome the fault will remain fruitless because the roots of the image are unconscious and there's resistance, right? The whole inner reasoning process, there's a, an inner no, but it's hidden from the intellect and it will remain so until you know, the image and the resistance is recognized. So another indication of an image is the repetition of certain incidents in one's life. So I don't know if, if that feels familiar, but this was always a huge key for me in all my path work and, and almost, you know, so clarifying, you know, cause every time I would be in some kind of emotional upset space, you know, or, you know, situation, you know, like I knew it felt familiar, like, you know, this is, this has been with me, it seems like forever, here I am again, you know, that would make the frustration and the pain of it, you know, so much more. And, you know, that doesn't help it, right? So, so then, you know, we, we get locked again in this very painful, you know, place where we're lost in an image and then we're, you know, judging and making ourselves wrong, but we can't do anything to change. And so we just keep recycling. So people got some ideas as we read through, it's sometimes helpful to have, you know, some ideas in your mind, you know, some concrete examples, you know, that the guide is sort of suggesting in a more general way that within your own life that you can work with as he describes and guides us with this. So, you know, if you can think of certain very familiar feeling places or dynamics, right, in relationship that seem familiar and frequent somehow and frustrating in your life. And so you can maybe just work with that a little and apply these words. So the image, image always, go ahead, yes. Well, just, uh... I was going to say it's not personal, but the image of well, it is personal. It came in my came up in my mind. Um, the image of a, a spider's web came to mind as as a kind of a a way of thinking about an image that that uh, kind of traps uh, things that uh, that come by and uh, holds them in a web. Um, 
you know, exactly. trying to trying to get away to to. to right, to, right. Um, no, that's it, and that's a, and it's an interesting image of an image, you know, like, and I think that has some value. I think it will help partly. I, I noticed the guide is being very generalized here, and so once he gets into some examples, it might help. And maybe if somebody else wants to give an example of an image here that they are familiar with or have worked with, then maybe that could help. Also, I'm familiar with my own personal core image, and and that is, I am not enough. There are a couple of other images that I tended to uh, recycle from time to time. One of them is I am helpless. Um, and another one is I am a victim. Good, and, yeah. You know, I mean, I... <laughs> Yeah, good, good examples, Frank. Yeah, you know, so so in that sense, you know, they're they're a belief that happened maybe from an experience that you know, or even you know, like parenting that wasn't supportive enough, right? You know, that then, you know, were, was traumatic. But but the what the guide says about an image is that you know the mind is trying to figure out you know how to navigate life and avoid the pain. Right. And so we want to we want to draw a conclusion about a circumstance that caused us pain so that we can recognize it or, you know, manipulate it when it comes up again so we can make sure we avoid it. So we want to understand why did that happen? You know, oh, it must be because, you know, the world is this way or I'm this way or you're, you know, all people or all women or all men or all, you know, like, so we, it's a, like the guide says, it's basically an overgeneralization. It's not that it's not even sometimes true, but what the mind does is it wants to make a shortcut and a little rule, right? And, and, and that doesn't really work very well in life, but it kind of gives the mind a sense of, you know, safety, like, right, you know, like, let me put things in a box and then I know, how, how to deal with them. So, and then some of those images are like Frank said, very debilitating for us, right? You know, like that we're not enough, you know, that, that you know, we're, we've been rejected. So something's wrong with us is another one that often, you know, like we feel deep down inside that, you know, something must be wrong with me. That's why all this happens. And so the feeling, you know, leads this kind of inner, state of consciousness that you know to me feels like really the child state of consciousness right and we can maybe live up above it but every once in a while things in in life you know we hit up against and it causes us to regress causes the the trauma to get re-triggered from that childhood place and then oftentimes we have some big emotional reaction or, you know, difficult moment for ourselves to go through. Um, so does that help kind of understand more what he's meaning when he says the image? Or the image. Thanks. Yeah. The image could cause you to avoid certain situations that you think are going to trigger you emotionally, right? These emotions, painful That's emotions the defense, that right? you don't yeah. want to feel again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so the the image goes. You know, this is the way the world is, or the situation is, and therefore I must be. Therefore, I must, you know, defend against it by withdrawing, by attacking, by submitting. You know, by by managing, trying to control the situation, and so now we're in the false self, trying to control trying to control God, trying to control life, trying to control the divine that is coming to us every moment, just as it is. And yet, you know, it's not our fault because we're, we're you know, trying to avoid this trauma and we don't know what to do with it. So part of what we want to work with eventually is like that trauma is like this frozen energy inside of us and so as we get conscious of the image and we understand the truth we need to go in and kind of create a, a soft loving unconditional gentle holding space for that trauma 
and we need to let that trauma dissolve out of our bodies and 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 at the same time we're also letting that image dissolve as well but it's it's still it's like it's we have to learn to relax and and there's certain places that are just you know you can even find them when sometimes you go in and feel in your body you know like you know you can relax to a certain point but you know it won't go any further you know because there's it's defending something and and so until we can hold ourselves and and kind of have a part of us that trusts our own self better than we trust the defense right so it's like the higher self has to come and be the protection rather than the defense and when the higher self awakens and is the protection and is the presence is the divine presence in there in that moment then the defense can let go and we can meet the experience again in a different way and release you know the held trauma and you know understand and integrate it right because that's what it needs to be is it's it's separated out all of the places of the image the energy you know doesn't harmonize and and is in these separate kind of messed up ways of you know uh, flowing so we're we're really doing this healing at a at an energetic level and then at the mental at the level of consciousness we're looking at you know healing the child traumas through understanding those you know beliefs that were created at that time and recognizing now that we have the resources to hold ourselves and that you know that's no longer true right and and to let the the fear go or go through the fear to see what will really happen which is again that shaman's death you know jump off the cliff see if you really die now but you only can jump if you have enough consciousness to know that it's you know sometimes life pushes you off the cliff but most of the time life is trying to you know ask us to recognize and take that leap ourselves. So often you do not notice the repetitive pattern in your life, my friends. You pass over the obvious. You still keep assuming that certain occurrences are due to coincidence or that some arbitrary fate is testing you or that other people are responsible for your repeated mishaps. You therefore pay much more attention to the slight variations of each incident than to the common denominator underlying them. Most psychologists have verified this process, but they have often failed to realize is that images seldom form in this life, no matter how early they begin. So this is where, you know, in the path work, we go beyond psychology into sort of this transpersonal level and, and past lives. And so it says most of the time, an image is carried over from one lifetime to another. This is why certain incidents do not form an image in people who are free of a particular conflict. Yet they will form one in a person's soul who has brought that conflict into this life. In another one of the lectures, the guide talks about, you know, soul dance. And he says, like, basically, we're, you know, resilient light bodies, but where we have these images, it's a place where in a previous lifetime, you know, there's been like a collapse of that resilience through wounding, right? And it, and it didn't get worked through in that lifetime. And so, you know, we come back in, carrying the soul dent into this life. But in that process is also the, the you know, hope that you know, it can actually be resolved and integrated in this life. But because of that, then, you know, we, we are both inclined to get re-wounded in those places and collapse into the wound. You know, it becomes like where we, where we get a punch from life and it's not in our soul dent, you know, we just bounce back. But where we get that punch from life and it's part of our soul dent, we collapse into it and it becomes part of our identity. 
so we're working now, you know, to, uh, you know, like recognize those, those soul dance and, and understand, you know, like the, it's, it's not, it's nobody's fault. You know, it's like, it's, it's like our, the guide is saying we even chose those are the parents that we chose to help us activate that soul dance. It has to get activated to get integrated. Right. And so he says, you know, what dignity it gives you to understand that you bring this stuff back in and you get lost in it and you suffer for it. But but you're really the you're really a being of light that is working, you know, to take this darkness back into the truth. Right. Out of its confusion and its lostness, its consciousness that's lost in confusion and darkness. Um, and, and so the earth plane is the plane that, that we can do that in ways that we can't in any other plane, this dualistic earth plane, he says. So, you know, we, we come in again, carrying these soul dents, these, these old wounds, you know, from, and, and he also says in another place that, you know, we, it's like, it's, it's part of the collective wound, right? So it doesn't even have to be our own wound, you know, maybe it's our clan previous life, who knows, you know, but, but we really are part, we all have gone through similar experiences of rejection, of suffering, of, you know, violence or not being seen in various ways, you know, so there's all kinds of, of, you know, ways that we're just working through almost archetypal patterns that are in the collective consciousness of humanity and each one is carrying our own peace. So he says, um, although it's essential to find the image and its origin in the present life, you know, even if it comes from the past life, it's important to find where it got re-triggered in the present life to adequately dissolve it. There are still cases where the knowledge of all the pertinent facts would be very useful to the therapist. In other words, an image can often be successfully treated without the knowledge of its origin in a previous life. But there are cases where the knowledge of the carryover principle would be invaluable. In an earlier lecture, I explained how an entity is prepared for life on earth how plans for what should be accomplished and overcome in the next incarnation are made according to previous existences. How the settled bodies surrounding the physical vehicle of the incarnate being are prepared so that the conflicts should bring the inner problems of the particular person to the surface. This is the basis on which families and other life circumstances are chosen. When an image carries over from previous lives, the incarnation takes place in an environment where provocations to that image are bound to occur, perhaps in response to similar images in the parents or others around the growing child. That is how the image brings out a problem. And only if something becomes a problem, will the person pay attention to it instead of looking away. If the image is ignored, circumstances will be much more difficult in the following life on earth until the conflicts become so overwhelming that outside factors can no longer be blamed for the pain inflicted by the wrong conclusions and misconceptions of the image. This is when the person begins to turn upward and inward. The only solution to your life's problems is to make your images conscious. I can give you advice on how to begin but you will not be able to accomplish it completely by yourself. You will need help. If you are serious in your desire to find and dissolve the images in your soul, for your life is not without problems, then pray to God. He will give you further guidance and lead you to the proper person with whom you can cooperate in your quest to find your images. You know, and this is also, you know, like the, the guide was always, you know, talking about working with helpers and, and having, you know, some other people to work with. And, and I think in the beginning, it's important. And, and yet, you know, I think that there is a way that when you deeply immerse yourself in this material, you can do a lot of this work as well with yourself, but it really helps to have another person's view with, with this as well. We don't always see ourselves as clearly. 
So this requires, among other things, humility, which as we know is very a very important asset for your spiritual development. Those who are constantly reluctant to work with another person lack humility only if in this one respect. Perhaps you also fear to face your images. You know, and I know for myself, you know, it was very hard, you know, coming into group, doing this work, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, maybe a little less so, you know, but, but you know, to, uh, you know, like there's a lot of shame around our images, right? It's, it's part of what comes with the package. And it's part of why we even know we got images, you know, where you got shame, you got an image, right? And yet, you know, shame is very difficult feeling and a troubling feeling for us to, you know, deal with. And, and really the only cure for it is exposure, right? Is going through and facing and feeling that and recognizing again, that it's a shaman's death, that it's not even real ultimately, right? But we can't know that until we actually re-experience it more consciously again. And of course, when we experience it the first time, it was, you know, we were shamed and we shamed ourselves and all of that. So, <clears throat> and then we also unconsciously were convinced that our images somehow protect us, but the guide says they do exactly the opposite. They actually bring to us everything we're <laughs> trying to avoid, which is again, part of the divine plan, right? <laughs> so we don't avoid anything. <laughs> So let me give you a very primitive example. A child has taken the bath. The water was boiling hot and therefore has injured the child. This child may come to the conclusion that taking baths is dangerous. The child will never take another bath if it can avoid it. Out of this misconception, conflicts will arise. In youth, the parents force the child to take a bath and every time this happens, the child will go through untold and unnecessary misery. In later life, other conflicts will come up. Either the person will actually follow the inner and conclusion, which is no longer conscious, or perhaps may find more rational explanations. But the uncleanliness will create new conflicts. Rejection from others will set in motion a new chain reaction. Or the person represses knowledge about the childhood incident, but realizes intellectually that resistance to bathing is unreasonable. He will force himself to bathe in spite of his strong emotional revulsion. And thus he will develop certain symptoms and connection with bathing that he cannot explain. Like whenever we force ourselves, right, you know, with the outer will, that's not the, the route either. So the mystery of such unreasonable reactions and the anxiety connected with them will present difficulties that cannot be overcome unless the image is found. Now, this is a very primitive example. Most of the time, the emotional reactions are much more subtle and complicated. I cannot stress enough that you are no longer aware of the original reasoning behind your conclusions. If you were confronted with the contents of your soul, you would laugh. You would say that they are entirely untrue. It is also important to understand that the chain reaction of consequences resulting from the original impression creates mishaps and hardships. And I'm going to back up a little because I don't know, a lot of times we still actually do believe the images, but oftentimes once we do get them really conscious, like we can see where there's untruth or half-truth in them, right? So a part of the, the thing is to really examine them uh, clearly uh, in this. But other times, yeah, you, you know, once you, you get it conscious and you recognize that is what you believe, you kind of immediately recognize that. That's, that's not true, of course. So um, he says, how can you find your personal image? Not by trying to change the symptoms, whatever they may be, but rather by working with them. So this is sort of like a key for the path work, right? And, and it's kind of the counterintuitive thing because our mind and our ego and our defenses want to always try to change and control. So these symptoms include our inability to overcome certain faults and attitudes, a lack of control over certain patterns in our life, fears and resistances on specific occasions. And the harder we try to eliminate the symptoms, without having understood their roots, the more we will exhaust ourselves in useless efforts. The symptoms are merely one part of the price we pay 
for the ignorant inner conclusions. So start searching for the image by thinking back on your life. And you know, you can even do this as a journal exercise, right? Finding all the problems, you know, go back like all the big problems or all the what's your litany, you know, even that's still with you from whenever. Write them down. Include problems of all sorts. You cannot do this unless you take the trouble to put them down concisely in black and white. If you merely think about them, you will not have the overview necessary for comparison. So you probably, you know, if anybody wants to do that a little bit as we go, I could, you know, give us a little time here. Um, but in general, you know, it's something that you might just take into your own work and if you have a helper or, you know, like, so along the lines of a daily review only here is like you're specifically searching through your whole history, right? And then, you know, you just kind of note them, right? And then you can see once they're all there in black and white, sort of what are the patterns, you know, what, what are the generalizations and the, the overview instead of the getting lost in, you know, in the haystack. So, you know, looking for that common denominator will help you discover an image. You know, and I think he's saying here that, you know, like even once we find an image, you know, there's more than one oftentimes, you know, or um, there are sometimes issues that are, are independent of images, but most of the time, you know, it's connected with images. And he says, even when it's independent of images, it can too be based on cause and effect. You know, it's, it's everything in the universe is based on this basic cause and effect, but it might not be connected to your image. So again, we can usually tell because of how we react, you know, we react in the defense. And when there is no image, oftentimes, you know, we're, we're not defensive, right? So, but be careful, my friends, do not put an occurrence aside superficially, assuming it is unconnected with your personal image, merely because it appears that way at first sight. Darlene, could I interrupt you for a sec? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to make sense of how would you be negatively affected if on some level you don't have that image? Um, I was under the impression that even duality, why we're all here, is a shared uh, social image, social uh, unconscious, right? Or shared unconscious. So can you, do you have an example of what you're referring to there as far yeah, as- Yeah, yeah, um, I, I think so. It's, I, I think I understand what you're saying. You know, I think there are certain ways, you know, he talks about this, you know, like it affects us differently, but it doesn't mean that we don't go through things. Right, there are certain mass events, there are certain, you know, effects that other people put into motion that, you know, we don't personally escape. But if we are not caught in an image around it, we will not suffer in the same way as the image. We will, you know, and we will navigate it with the higher self and find, you know, our best way through it, right? And it won't be damaging to the spirit in any way. You know, we might even be, you know, part of, you know, leadership or part of, you know, uh, you know, we were, we were meant to go through that, you know, uh, not from the negative experience, but as part of our service in some way. Does that help? No, not, not quite. Um the way that I understood what you said is that there's some negative things that we experience that still impact us that are not based on an image. Is, did you, did you already answer that just now? Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's I what did. I was okay. talking about. Right. You know, like, like, you know, that, that he's saying most things are right. And even if they're not, there's still lawful cause and effect, right? You know, it's still something that we agreed to experience. It's still something that, you know, is purposeful in our experience, right? 
And, and if we do experience it, we will not get uh, tempted into darkness by it, right? We will not be triggered into pain body states. We will not have what the guide calls hard pain, right? He says, life has pain. We're in a world where there's life and death. There's, you know, pleasure and pain. There's, you know, it's like we, we don't get a free pass for everything. But we, if we don't have the hard pain, if we don't have the resistance against the pain, you know, if we don't have an image that says, you know, the pain is, you know, going to kill us or whatever, and we're, we're, you know, defending and fighting against it, then the experience of it will be very, very different and will be, you know, positive in some way, you know, even maybe difficult, but, but still on the backside of it, you know, it's, it's like it will be a value for the soul and maybe for, you know, people that the soul was able to help with that capacity. <clears throat> See, is there an example that you want to give me that, that you, you know? No, that no, you, that makes sense. I, I, I can, yeah, discern the two now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So yeah, so um, the common denominator might not be easy to find. Whoop, let me back up a little bit. Where were we? So all unpleasant experiences are probably connected with your image, at least in some ways, right? So especially when we feel there's a certain type of unpleasant you know, that is this contraction against the contraction, right? Is the resistance to something that we're experiencing that may not be totally pleasant. And when we contract against the contraction, we make the pain even greater. And, and we can begin to listen and learn when we're doing that and surrender to the pain that is and, and makes life a lot easier, even the painful parts. And I don't know, you can explain, explore with your back pain, even right now, Frank, if you want to, right? You know, like, like in some pains are, are you know, not going to be helped immediately or, you know, right away. But sometimes even where, you know, we're in chronic pain, if we can relax around that chronic pain and drop into what we think is going to be more intense, but maybe for a minute and then something lets go, or maybe we bring some kind of presence of compassion you know, in just being with that place of agony inside of us, right? You know, that's a physical pain of some kind. And, and the space of compassion helps open and that helps relieve and lessen. Whenever contraction is pain, expansion is pleasure, right? And so when we can remember to try to expand inside of a contraction instead of contract inside of a contraction. Sometimes it's not possible, but when we can, it helps. I had a lot of experience with back pain. So I, I kind of have all kinds of little mind games that I play with it. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. So you might try that one if you haven't, but yeah, I <laughs> Chronic pain is a tough one to be with. So since only after you've thoughtfully grasped your image, will you be in a position to judge which of your experiences, if any, have something to do with it? Until then, you must refrain from final judgments about the events in your life. In meditation, in serious self-probing, in checking your emotional reactions about the past and present, and through prayer, you will find after a long and arduous search, the common denominator. It is pride. <laughs> Your self-will says, if I do not want the risk of life, I do not want the pain of life. Oh, okay. So it's like self-will says, I do not want the risk of life. I do not want the pain of life. Therefore, I draw this conclusion, which seems to safeguard me against it. So this is where we, we you know, are trying to protect ourselves so the image seems to be like this belief that then you know if we know what that is then we can do this and that's how we protect so but it's like this conclusion which seems to safeguard us is is not a safeguard 
for it will bring you the very trouble you are trying to escape from, since life cannot be cheated. This is the merciful law of God. Otherwise, you would never emerge from the misery of the lower, darker planes of consciousness. Only when you begin to face your own wrong conclusions and fears are you ready to accept life for what it is, then you will be able to cure your soul. It is a necessary step in your development to give up some of the self-will that wishes to deny life in its present form. Only then will you have acquired the humility not to wish for protection from the risks and hardships of life. Your difficulties will cease to be necessary once you can fearlessly accept and shoulder them. That's a really kind of important and powerful paragraph there. I think I'm going to like highlight it with the other one again and even go back to it myself. Because this, this idea of the self-will, you know, that controls, right? And, and, and in that, you know, it's like that control is a denying of life in its present form. It's like, uh, like I'm saying, the resistance to what is, right? And, and that is what creates the hard pain and the suffering. So this other practice, right? I know there's an Adi Ashanti um, meditation that I like a lot where he just says that we're gonna do a, an exploration of what happens <laughs> inside when we just allow everything to be as it is, right? Just to do a meditation sitting and noticing inside of yourself in, in your energy system, you know, allowing whatever arises in your consciousness and just being with it, allowing everything. And, and that's a nice meditation that kind of, I think, goes along with this. So it's a good beginning to review your life concisely, enumerating all your troubles, and then go on to search for the common denominator. Do not turn away from anything hastily, even if it appears to be unconnected to your problems. And, you know, if everybody, you know, if you want to also, like, if nothing is, like, you know, this whole longer review, another way is like, well, what's the most recent thing that has been a disharmony in your life, you know, or where you were triggered by something? And if it's, you know, relatively recent, you can easily go back and work with that, right? And that, like, where we're triggered, there's PTSD there, right? And where there's that, there's this contracted and, and you know, rigid image that we have to see, understand, lovingly hold, melt, dissolve, you know, bring in light and truth to. Because it's a terrified child in so many ways, right? So don't turn away from anything hastily probe and you may experience a surprise and the most apparently unconnected happenings often turn out to have a single common denominator and when you have found that you have made a major step forward in your search for then you possess a clue to the image but the common denominator by itself is not yet the key to the image it is a strong directive but by no means does it open the door that will make you fully understand your whole life in order to get to the self-image, or get to the image itself, to all the devious ways in which it was formed and to understanding the process of your reactions when you formed it, you will have to explore your unconscious more thoroughly. There are various ways to do this. If you begin the way I have suggested here and pray for guidance, being ready to overcome your pride so you can be open with another person, God will lead you to further victory, you know, to, to reveal it to yourself, to reveal it to each other, you know, even in your groups, that kind of thing, right? So don't let yourself be dissuaded by your inner resistance, for that resistance is just as erroneous and short-sighted as the image itself. In fact, the very same quality that makes you resist is the one that created the image in the first place without your knowing it, and will continue to create untold misery for you counteracting your conscious wishes. Indeed, your resistance causes you to lose what could be rightfully yours. 
So have enough wisdom to see through your resistance and to evaluate it for what it is worth. Do not let yourself be governed by it. How can you be a spiritual person who is developed and detached in the right sense? If you remain governed by your unconscious forces and by the erroneous and ignorant conclusions that have formed such a painful image within you. This image is the one factor in your life responsible for every unhappiness. And no one but you is responsible for your images. True, you did not know any better when you formed them, but you do now. Therefore, you are now equipped to eliminate the source of your unhappiness. And please do not say, how can I be responsible for other people repeatedly acting in certain ways towards me? As I said before, your image draws these happenings to you as inevitably as night must follow day. It is like a magnet, a physical law, like the law of gravity. Your images influence the universal current entering your personal life sphere so that certain effects must follow. If you do not have the courage to develop into your unconscious face, your image, dissolve it, and thus make a new person out of yourself, you will never be free in this life. You will always be chained and bound. The price for freedom is the courage and humility to face up to things. When you have taken all the necessary steps, the victory of freedom brings such joy that nothing can mar your happiness. Furthermore, you can be quite sure that the image you do not dissolve in your life will have to be dissolved in a future one. This should not be taken as a threat, my friends. Anything, how can anything be a threat that liberates you from your own chains? You must not take it that way. You must merely see realistically that the sooner you find your images of your own accord, and not because your images keep acquiring new twists so that your life is becoming too much for you, the easier your life will become. You may say in certain moments, all this about being born again with the same problems may be speculation. There may not be another life after all. Why should I go through all the trouble now? But I say to you that you should undertake this work for the sake of this life for it is never too late and always well worth the effort. Your remaining years will mean a different kind of life. You will be free instead of chained. And it really is kind of like, you know, I think being born again in the life that we're really living and part of what we came here to do. You know, very powerful and profound transformations are really here. So he's saying, you know, don't worry about the reincarnation stuff, you know, do it for yourself or this life. And, and reap the benefits because it sets us free to fully be who we are and to no longer be bound by all of these, you know, tight, contents, contracted, painful places. And, and we're free when it's flowing, right, to listen to the guidance and follow the Holy Spirit and the unfolding of life and, you know, gratitude and fulfillment. And that doesn't mean that we won't sometimes have hardship and we're certainly going to die, right? But, but it means a whole different level of living. In addition, by finding your image, even to some degree, you may form a pretty accurate idea of what you have yet to fulfill. You know, I like that about it, right? You know, it's like there's something about the path work that kind of really helps me know exactly what my cutting edge is, where I'm working, what's up in me, you know, what my unconscious is revealing, you know, I'm just projecting it out and it comes back to me and oh, that's what it is, right? So it's a beautiful system when we can learn to really work it and let go of both the pride and the shame, you know, connected around these things and just the fear of the feelings, right? So consider what conditions you require to resolve your conflicts in order to fulfill your life task. Of course, the actual next existence will depend on your development during the rest of this life too. 
Do not forget that the law of cause and effect or the law of karma specifies that people are always given the chance to solve their problems in the easiest circumstances possible. When not enough courage and willpower are mustered in easy circumstances, the life that follows must necessarily be a little more difficult. And if again, the courage, humility, and willpower are not mustered, the life afterward will be more difficult still. Ultimately, when the going gets really hard, you will be forced to face your troubles instead of fleeing them. And the guide said in another lecture we were doing just recently, you know, like sometimes, you know, we think like a really hard life was a difficult, but, you know, like in the spirit world, you know, we could have gained a lot and grown a lot in that lifetime and, and a kind of an easy life sometimes, you know, is not so fruitful spiritually, not that the personality doesn't appreciate, right, you know, but um by law, our, our lives, you know, are going to reflect exactly where we're at. And that's what he's saying. We're always traversing our inner soul substance. And, and our soul and our higher self have chosen, you know, to face and work through certain aspects that, that we are, you know, like the next step in our evolutionary journey, what we need to learn and work on. And so we violate divine law when we escape from ourselves instead of facing ourselves. This should bring into clearer focus a controversial subject among people interested in spiritual life. People are uncertain and confused about how to react to tests, trials, and hardships. One school of thought claims God does not send tests. God is love. How could he want us to be unhappy? Well, this is true, my friends. The other school of thought says that it is necessary that we experience tests and therefore they are God's will. As tests come, we should accept them in humility and thus prove our worthiness of God's mercy and bliss. This is equally correct, my friends. But the full truth lies in the middle or rather in an extension of these two concepts. God has made perfect laws and given his children free will. If the laws could not be violated, then free will would not exist. The perfection of the law is that the long-term remedy is an effect of these very violations. So that, you know, like, like we're in a learning curve, right? And we're gonna, you know, when we choose to violate the law, there will be consequences. And through those consequences, our deep inner being is learning. We don't have to judge it. We don't have to make it bad. We don't have to, you know, try to make it faster. We just have to accept, you know, the, the products of our own creations and trust that, you know, doesn't make us bad and God still loves us and, and, and you know, will show us the way through. And the more that we twist these laws, consciously or unconsciously, the more they work against our interests until we reach a point where we can't twist them any further and have to eventually change the direction of our inner will. In God alone lies infinity. And if you choose any other direction, you must eventually turn around and seek union with the divine because only strict adherence to the divine can be infinite. Violation of anything divine must therefore perform force be finite, you cannot infinitely twist the law. Your violation of divine law reaches a point where you automatically again begin to work for the good. And part of this, I feel like, you know, is part, you know, there's this, this natural learning curve, right? You know, it's like, we just think we should punish ourselves to make us do it better next time or something. And, you know, like, we don't need to do that. That only makes us forget and go unconscious and act out again. So, you know, we just trust each moment is teaching us and each cell in our body, if it's here in this moment, is learning the lesson it came to receive. It is very true that to take a test in a spirit of humility with the attitude of Father, thy will be done is the right thing. But this is not enough if you want to attain a higher level. The highest and the best thing you can do is not only to take the test, but also to search for your images. Your unconscious wrong conclusions are directly responsible for the tests you are experiencing at any given time. 
And in order to find your images, you cannot be impatient with yourself, for it is utterly impossible to find, comprehend, and dissolve an image in a short time. It is a long, drawn-out process. And even after you have understood your images, the re-education of your emotions, long condition to follow a distortion, takes time, effort, and patience. So as one school of thought says, patience and humility are absolutely necessary. You may revolt against unhappiness, yet when you realize that you, not God and the fates are to blame, your revolt may turn against yourself and you thus will also become impatient with yourself. With such currents, you will never succeed in finding and dissolving your image. You must be in a relaxed state of mind. Such a state of mind can be yours if you understand and accept the length of the search. Once you accept your inability to become perfect quickly, you humbly accept temporary unhappiness. Try that on for size even more. Like, you know, what does it mean inside of you? You know, how, how does that land? How can you find that place of accepting your inability to become perfect quickly? Humbly. You know, just accept this temporary unhappiness of your imperfection. However it shows up. See if you can find that place. Anybody want to comment? Uh, Darlene, uh -huh. Hi, I jumped Dan. in a little late, sorry. Um, yeah, I had the time screwed up, but um, I, I'm gonna not have you roll the screen back, but uh, jump. I'm, I'm sitting on a, the thought of you cannot do it alone. For some reason that's sticking in my brain. And uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing the options of not doing it alone. I mean, I feel like I'm kind of not doing it alone, but I also feel like part of me is doing it alone and it's a bit confusing for me. And then the second part is, and this one's a tough one for me to admit, I'm, I'm noticing that um, my memory is getting uh, worse and partly because I got this, uh, this uh, Zoom late. And um, I'm wondering, is there a source for that in rooted somewhere or is it just a physical age? phenomenon that's going on. So that's a, that's, um, that's a bit confusing for me. I don't know if we have time to answer that tonight, but anyway, there it is. Okay, yeah. And I, I would just explore like the feelings that come up in in all of that, you know, as one avenue of, of working with a deck, you know, and, and you know, let, rather than figuring it out, feel it out a little bit and see where that might take you. Um, yeah, the memory thing, you know, it's like, I mean, some people even are saying it's just part of the upgrade, you know, and all this energy that's coming into the earth, they call it ascension flu, you know, but we're all getting older and certainly our brains are shrinking. <laughs> so, you know, and, and then there's, you know, a lot of poisons and then, you know, I think we're, you know, but this is where, you know, this kind of movement of accepting like everything that's happening is really in divine order in some way, right? I, I had a question, of, well, I, I don't know where it was back a ways in the, in the lecture, but um, in fact, it was right at the beginning. The, uh, the guide was saying that if you saw these things, you would, you would laugh. Did I, did I, did I hear that right? Yeah, he said he, he did say that some of, I mean, you know, he does say that, but I, I kind of amended that because, you know, Frank gave the example, for instance, of, of his belief, right, you know, that, you know, he's somehow not enough, right, you know, well, when we come into these realizations, you know, of these beliefs inside, like, I mean, ultimately, our conscious mind can probably challenge them, you know, and, and say that, you know, what does that really mean? And how can that, you know, ultimately be true? Or, you know, you know, we want mm -hmm. to do, but I don't know that we actually laugh about that because we're identified and we still feel 
the suffering that's in that belief structure. Now, you know, I've, you know, realized some other images that I've had, you know, that, that when I've gotten down to the bottom of them, I've seen where they come from, their irrationality, right? I never laugh at my child for them because that would not be very kind, right? You know, the child believes these and have a good reason to believe these. But I do need to know that they are fundamentally not true. And oftentimes if I can come in and, you know, lightly explain to my child, you know, how she got confused, you know, and, you know, like they say, angels fly because we take ourselves lightly, you know, it's like there's this way that you don't, you know, it's nothing needs to be heavy, right? But, but you can re-educate that child and help her, you know, or him recognize mm -hmm. that there is a kind of laughable, not truth, you know, but, but holding that truth for all of these years has caused a lot of pain and that's not so funny, right? Mm -hmm. No, but just a, the, the example that came up for me was backseat driving today. I was not driving, I was a passenger. And, um, you know, and it's just sort of uh, like the, um, it's like, I see it now. I'm so conditioned about this. Makes me wonder who I really am in this situation. Outside of the massive conditioning that, that, I, that I assume is so important, you know? So well, um, you know, so-, so I didn't feel, laugh out so loud, but it was, it was not, but it was kind of a little- um, Right. I don't know. So the image there might have been the, you know, you're seeing the image of your self-importance, right? You know, and, and right, you like recognize who, that that, like you know, is here, not yeah. so true. Who is here? What's going on? <laughs> Look at this guy. There right, he goes right. again. Yeah. Right. right. And, and that's good, you know, and especially if we can, you know, just sort of see the, the silliness, right? You know, and not be cruel in the laughter, right? Not judgmental in the laughter. Right. Just, you it's know, not a mock uh, there's the ego silly. again, you know, silly yeah. thing, you know, silly thing. It's just, yeah. it's like, that's how it is, you know? Really and so, cool. yeah, we just, you know, take ourselves lightly. Good, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I wasn't sure, Dick, if we got, did I cover, you wanna go back to your first part of your question? Uh, it, was, it was about, um, can't do it yourself. Um, what were your the options uh, that you right, see? Right, right, right. So, I mean, I think what the guide is mostly speaking to in this lecture, you know, and it's fairly early in the lecture, you know, like saying people really, this path makes a difference if you have a helper. Don't just read these lectures and think that you can do the path. You know, you have to do the work. And, and because we are so you know, sort of unconscious about ourselves, we don't see ourselves very clearly. And so we need to be willing to risk showing ourselves to somebody else, you know, like to have a helper at least and, and you know, share and bring out, you know, everything and let them probe and bring out more, right? You know, um, it's it's usually takes a, a while for us to really discover ourselves and 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 then you know I think at a certain point we still can't do it by ourselves because what what I've noticed and I, I was never good at letting my helper or the group hold my traumatized child right my traumatized child was always a little bit you know but my tra traumatized child did begin to learn how to let me hold her and let my higher self hold her. And then with that, then she can let others hold her. So, and, and, and we need, you know, we need that on many levels, but, you know, in, in that situation, we, we're not really alone and we can't do this alone. We have to also have our own higher self and our own self present and holding ourselves. So the guide's not specifically referring to that here, I don't think, but I would add that, <laughs> you know, in my experience. Um, and, and then once we have that connection, then I think, you know, but that's often after many years of work, you know, that we get to that level of capacity of self 
understanding and, and ability to do the work on our own and do the meditations and go into our our feelings and, and that. And, and when we can do that and we are like really working with spirit, then I think in a way we're getting sessions from our own guides, right? So, so we still might need a session with a human being every once in a while where we feel stuck or where we're still struggling with something, you know? So many, many helpers no longer, ha no matter how long they've been doing path work, still see a helper themselves, you know, at least occasionally, you know, in their, in their life journey. So did that answer it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of answers it. Uh, you know, not the risk of taking up too much time, but somehow I get the feeling sometimes that um, the path work that people, at least, you know, in the, in the uh, what, the Eastern Coast, what, I forgot the name of the sections out there, but um, they almost, at least from my point of view, emphasize helpers only uh, almost too much. And what I'm kind of discovering, and I'll throw this out there, is that one is I, I created a little support group from another session I took, for example, with Liam Quirk, and we meet every couple of weeks uh, in Zoom. And uh, that's been really, feel like really good support. And then I have, uh, you know, some people in, in Denver here that also we get together. Uh, and that feels like I'm guided in that way, too. I know Frank's yeah. forming a big group as well. I mean, it seems like support can come from any number of places, not just mainly focused on quote unquote helper, you know, just the thought. Absolutely. I mean, I think and I think that's true, you know, and, I, and, and yet I think the more conscious the group is, the, you know, the, the better, right? You know, so like if you have brand new people, you know, no. trying to reflect, you know, but absolutely, you know, we it's a community thing. It's a collective thing. And as we get more conscious, you know, to, to be helping, you know, in other kinds of support groups is great, you know, because it's again, you know, that we're risking being connected. We're risking, you know, revealing ourselves, you know, you might see like, you know, is it just a discussion group or, or are you, you know, holding yourselves in other ways it, I don't know you know each each all of it's good none of it's bad but just kind of you know there's I think different levels of support that maybe we're talking about here but yeah I take your point it doesn't have to be just a helper for sure or can it even be a therapist you know uh, that is good or you know another kind of spiritual path that has a lot of this it's everywhere now in some ways yeah, why well, we get a lot of support from Eckhart Tolle, so that's another source. Yeah, so I think it's it's good to just blend a lot of it. But like you know, this is one of the things that I've been so grateful for. When I first you know was a kid, and I was seeking very young, you know, I was like thirteen when I was trying to figure all of this stuff out, <laughs> and you know, there just wasn't that much out there, and and and, and it was very very limited, and so like. You know, the fact that, you know, it's so much out there and, you know, so many ways of speaking the truth and so many voices of guidance that are there, we're, we're blessed, you know, to have all of this light on the planet in the midst of this shaking, right? So, darling. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I do think that, uh, this concept, this finding your core image and dissolving it is one of the fundamental cornerstones of transformation uh, within, especially within the pathwork, you know, right. ideology, pathwork method. Um, and the guide is, he keeps saying over and over again, your image, your image. Um, so he is trying to tell, tell us that each one of us has our own particular core image around which all of our psychological distortions revolve in a vicious cycle and keep recycling and keep revolving. And uh, this is this particular lecture 
is I think like you, you said in the beginning, uh, uh, you know, it's a, a fundamental lecture for sure, you know? Yeah, this is, not just, this is not just one of those things where you say, oh, image, what kind of, well, you know, what pictures do I have in my head? No, right. this is what do I think about myself? How do I think Beliefs. about myself? Right. How do I bring myself to the world? How do I, what governs my, my uh, actions and reactions to everything in life? Uh, you know, that's what this, that's what's going on here. Right. And, and, you know, you're referring very specific, like there's like, that's like you said, the core image or the self image, right. You know, which is so critical because if we have a negative self image, there's no way we can be happy or, you know, right, like, right. like in, in life and, and, and connected to the higher self, right. You know, that automatically separates us from God. So that negative self image, which the guide calls the idealized self image, usually, you know, as well, you know, or it's like that's the counter action to the negative self image is, is, you know, really important. And then, you know, probably connected, but we also have, you know, like images about other things, right? You know, images yeah. about people or about events or about circumstances or, you know, uh, so, but, but the core image, like you said, or this, this, you know, self image is, is really key and and is the source of uh, like most of our suffering like you're saying you know so if we can if we can get to the root of that and know who we are know our value know our connection to god right then no matter what we're going through you know even when we're recreating our image which we may still you know but um that 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 we're we're not lost in the same way that that we were before and we can continue to work it and do this purification and this healing and transformation so absolutely and in the mystical sense of it i mean adding the um reincarnation and all of that you know into the equation you one could say that the the, the image is the human manifestation of your soul dent, you know, uh, because when you <laughs> when you ask somebody what's the, what's your soul dent, they might say, "Oh, what? You know, how am I supposed to know that?" You know. Yeah, I mean, and that's I mean, knowing this is you know really what he's talking about here. It just takes time to uncover and see clearly because it's like the images are are the sea that we're swimming in you know we we we're living in it we don't see them very clearly and so we have to separate out and see what we're doing and that's also why having other people sharing reflecting you know reacting to us is is a part of that darlene yeah. i have a question mm -hmm. When it comes to, you know, they, they were mentioning the past lives, you know, you can bring in a image from a past life and that, that's most likely what happens. Um, does it, do any of the past works talk about past life regression and whether or not that's something that is mentioned? So in this lecture, a little bit, the guide covers it and a few others, you know, and basically he's saying, you know, that it can help. I mean, in this lecture, he said, sometimes it's good to understand where it came from in another lifetime. But in general, he says, it, it needs to be worked in terms of, you know, what was the, you know, wound in this lifetime. And it contains all of the elements that we need to transform it there. Yeah, so, I, I only ask because I, um, recently had a past life regression and it was really interesting in that I didn't know why uh, after I went through the life in the hyp hypnotized state in the session um, the lady asked you know the spirit guide why they showed me this life and I was kind of skeptical about the whole thing until the guide said well the reason I sh we showed her this is because we had you know to work with her fear of being authentic and speaking from her authentic self. 
<clears throat> and I had been having issues around, you know, I have a podcast and I was having anxiety around releasing episodes every time I would get the weird anxiety and I didn't know why I was getting it, but it felt like very much like I'd go into fight or flight and the past life regression showed a past life where I was killed for speaking out from my authentic self. And it was, you know, I didn't tell the hypnotizer that, but at that point I was like, wow, it feels like I'm being shown this, um, to help deal with what I'm going, you know, I have going on in my life. And then after the session, I noticed that the anxiety significantly lessened. Mm -hmm. And so today's listening to this today, I was like, wow, it's really interesting. Right. That's the guy that's talking right, about right, this. Right. And I exactly. felt that. So there was a, you know, a belief that formed that said, you know, like to speak my authentic self is to get, you know, just, you know, get burned no. at the stake or, you know, to be, you know, be in danger. Yeah. So I have to, you know, and we we're talking about a lot of the uh, block at the throat, you know, is also connected with that probably. Yeah. So. Oh, God, I hadn't put that together. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that piece, but yeah, you're right. I always feel it in my throat. So good. Yeah. Good examples. And, and definitely, you know, it's like, uh, you know, and, and for me, you know, I don't even remember much in this life. Right. But I can work with my images on the emotional plane level easily. Right. So, you know, what we remember specifically is not, you know, it's like everybody's kind of wired differently. And so, you know, but, but we all have access to this information in, in different ways. So, and and to kind of just uncover right you know these these deep unconscious inner negative beliefs that we have or whenever we're in a negative situation you know ask ourselves well you know like what is my expectation what is my assumption how did i come into this you know what was the negative belief that i might have started with So he says, um, the best, last best and highest stage of this earth plane um, is where, you know, like, okay, so it says, uh, hold on a second. I guess um, purification cannot come cheaply and it would indeed be cheap if a mere list of faults and attempts to overcome them were all that comprised it. Purification is more than that. You cannot become purified unless you understand and control your own unconscious. And that is a long journey. You will receive help if you are willing to embark on this journey. However, you should understand that you are doing this work for God and for yourself. What God wants for you, you must, must be your own best interest. So you are really not making the sacrifice to God since God and the true you are one. Think about that, my friends. Some people are so selfish that they do not want to do anything for God that inconveniences them. At the same time, they are blind enough to believe that what God wants for them is contrary to their own happiness. Others are willing to sacrifice anything for God, although without understanding their images, they will never truly succeed the more happiness results from their sacrifices, the worse their guilt becomes until true inner happiness is conceived. Such guilt is always a twist of the emotions and is connected with the image. Actually, true happiness cannot come before the image and the guilt are understood and dissolved. But in their present state of mind, such people feel very heroic if their guilt mingles with their devotion. Feels like I skipped something here. Let's see. We're talking about accepting the test and the purification. I guess we did. Um, so then basically there's a couple of pretty good question and answers here. Um, you mentioned willpower and courage twice tonight. Are the batteries of both recharged by prayer? Of course, if you pray specifically for willpower and courage for a good purpose, as outlined in this lecture, 
the prayer will certainly be answered. If you pray for something else, you will get something else, provided it is good and according to law. It is so very important to know what to pray for at any given stage of your development. People seldom realize that they must pray to get ahead. Often it is not clear to you what you need most at specific phases of your development. You may put emphasis on something that is less important now than it was two months ago. Your needs may have changed. As Christ said, knock and it will be opened unto you. The knocking symbolizes being alert and interested enough to figure out what you need most at various stages of your path. So take that in for a minute, you know, like see what are your, where is your knocking, you know, what is your seeking, what direction or what aim does it have in this moment? The path constantly changes and you surely cannot pray with equal concentration on everything at once, which I love because, you know, like sometimes I can remember when I was early here in the path work, you know, a lot of my fear was, you know, I had to fix everything at once, you know, but turns out there's a kind of a natural order to our, our growth and development and we can just trust taking one thing at a time. So the questions, are all our limitations a result of the image? Most of them are, but not entirely. You will always have limitations as long as you are still in the cycle of incarnations. And as long as you have not reached the state of divinity, you cannot be a universal genius. Limitations on a broader scale have nothing to do with your images. But if you encounter limitations placed on your talents, and cannot make sufficient use of them, then that certainly has something to do with your images. So I think, you know, here, like in, in each lifetime in some ways, you know, we're selecting a certain slate of capacities and a certain slate of limitations that, you know, that we're not working on or we don't have access to, right? You know, we're only a portion of our vaster soul. And, and we're taking in kind of 50% light and 50% darkness, the guide says in another lecture, right? And, and so, you know, some of the limitations are just natural limitations of the times or, you know, and, and are part of what we're choosing to encounter and deal with. And, and it's also possible that those limitations could create a new image for us, right? You know, as we encounter them in this lifetime and maybe react to them in some way. So, you know, but not, not all our limitations are images, right? The image is a very specific, you know, belief aspect, a negative belief overgeneralized, right? To all circumstances somehow. And so like there then, you know, where we have these limits on our capacity of, our, of the things that we really have a longing to bring forth that, you know, we feel like we're here to, to work with, you know, then oftentimes that would have to do with our images. So he says, I will retire now with blessings of a special kind that are coming to each of you, my dear ones. It is the blessing of courage that you all so badly need. And I beg of you to use it in the right way. For if you open your heart and soul to the strength flowing to each one of you, you will feel courage. And if you keep that strength, you can make it last for a while, but use it where it does the most real good for you. Do not use it for non-essentials. It is up to you how to use this force. You receive it and you have free will to open yourself to it. You should know what to do with it. It will be a test of how you use the strength if you accept it now willingly. The love of God touches all of you, my dear ones. Be in peace, be in God. So there are several other lectures in this series on images. There's about four, I think, altogether. So, you know, and, and so we'll continue exploring images as we go through the next few weeks. But thank you, everybody. Is there any final comments, questions, or? Anything more to be said? Thanks, Darlene. Really enjoyed this lecture. Good. Hi, Jasmine. Good to see you. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Nice, nice group, hopefully. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you, Darlene. Have a good night. Take care.